deep roots in Cleveland and um, this story intersects with Cleveland in a couple ways. Though I am here at my bookstore in Lawrence, Kansas right now and a lot of the story happens here, um, we'll see that that I couldn't quite shake Cleveland uh, no matter how hard I tried as I did this. So I've got uh, some slides I'll throw up just to keep me organized and to have some visual aids. Um, this is a little bit about, um, I'm going to talk about how to resist Amazon and why that's important. Um, and I can't not talk about that when I'm talking about this, but I'm also going to kind of share the story of how this came together. Cause I think it's also a really interesting small business story in a way it's about a small business finding its voice uh, over really a 30 year history. Um, so a little bit of background on how we got here and then we'll get to the Amazon stuff. Um, this is the Raven bookstore when it opened, it opened in September 1st, 1987. Um, we've been in the same location in downtown Lawrence at 6 East 7th Street since then um, and for the next two months. Uh, in, in July, we will move into a brand new location that is currently under construction. Um, I got to visit our new bookshelves last night, actually, which is really exciting and go see, to the carpenter shop and see them in progress. Um, the, the Raven, um, for its first 20 years, first 30 years was a woman owned business as well. These are the founders, um, Pat Katie and Mary Lou Wright. Um, they were college friends that decided to open a, a, a mystery and crime fiction focused bookstore together in their home of Lawrence, Kansas. Um, they were told that book selling was a hobby every time they went to the bank. So they could not find um, any financing and they had to kind of piece it together. Mary Lou took out a second mortgage on her home. Uh, they did crowdfunding before that was a thing and got a bunch of small donations from their friends and community and kind of scrapped it together. So since the beginning, the Raven has faced steep odds and found a scrappy way to, to figure it out. And I think that spirit lives on today and a lot of stuff we're going to talk about. Um, in 1997, directly across the street from us, the Borders Books and Music uh, Superstore opened. Um, we can still see the building right over here. Uh, it's empty now, um, but we're still literally in its shadow. Uh, so Pat and Mary Lou had to figure out how to deal with that, the much larger corporate competition across the street and the issues associated with it. Um, so one thing they did was they, they just started being advocates for small business and they, they went to the newspapers and they talked to reporters whenever they could and they made kind of small business storytelling a big part of what they did. Uh, and they were very good at selling books. They were crime fiction experts. They held author events. They did all the things a bookstore does really well, but they also made it a point to tell their story and explain the importance of small businesses uh, to, to their community. Um, the, the main way to do that um, was again through newspapers. Um, so the, just in terms of the, the odds they were facing, what, what a small bookstore across the street from Borders in the 1990s was facing. Uh, Borders regularly offered 30% discounts on books. Um, the way pricing works for books is generally we have a 43 to 46% discount from uh, publishers. And with that 46% of a book's price, we have to pay rent, our employees and everything else. Uh, so you subtract 30 from that uh, and you're, you're dealing with a razor thin margin that's really unsustainable. Um, Borders can deal with that a lot of ways that a small bookstore can't. Um, They've got they've, they're huge. They have a huge corporate kind of infrastructure. Uh, they have an incredible volume of sales. They have an inventory with millions of books. Um, and also, it was discovered through advocacy from the American Booksellers Association in the '90s and later litigation um, that Bar Borders and Barnes and Noble were getting better terms from publishers. So while independent bookstores were getting that 46% discount, Borders and Barnes and Noble were getting up to 55, uh, permitting them to have those those huge discounts um, and the, the ABA took Borders and Barnes & Noble to court. That was settled, but for a long time, we just had to deal with the fact that the giant store across the street was selling cheaper books than us. Uh, and then, of course, also, at any point when there's, when there's a big corporate uh, franchise like that in town, less of that money is staying in Lawrence, Kansas. You know, a lot of that money was going back to Ann Arbor, where Borders is headquartered. Um, so that wasn't a local business, and, and the, the percentage of money that was sticking around reflected that. Um, so they did it. Um, they hung on, uh, they figured it out. They kind of doubled down on that storytelling and being really good at what they did. Uh, flash forward to 2008, I purchased the Raven, or no, in 2017, actually. Um, it sold in 2008 um, to Heidi Rock, who you see right next to me in that photo. Um, and then I started working there as a grad student 
Uh, my wife and I moved to Lawrence in 2014. I got a part-time job working at the Raven and fell in love with the book business. So much so, I decided to buy the bookstore when I graduated. Um, and I also, continue, as you can see, I continued the tradition of, of talking about this stuff in the press. Um, I, I tend to say yes anytime a reporter calls, just because I learned from Pat and Mary Lou, it's important, an important way to get your story out there. Um, let's see, what's next? So um, the, the, the competition now, of course, borders closed in 2011, the whole chain shut down, um, but left in its shadow and, and developing the whole time really was Amazon, uh, which ended up being a much bigger threat. Uh, and it, it's, it's a much scarier, much more difficult thing uh, for bookstores to deal with than Borders ever was and then Barnes & Noble is today. In fact, I would argue we're kind of on the same team as, Border, as Barnes & Noble at this point, just brick and mortar book selling at all. Uh, so here are um, six really quick reasons. Um, if a lot of you are small business owners, um, you know, I think a lot of this is familiar, um, which is good because a lot of people are talking about this, but a really kind of quick answer to why it's important to resist Amazon. Um, it has huge impacts on the, the retail and, and book industry. I'm talking about pricing uh, with with bar with borders the 30 percent discount that's worse with amazon and amazon frequently is discounting 50 or 60 percent especially on bestsellers to the point where amazon is selling books retail for less than i pay wholesale for them uh if i have to pay 15 dollars for a book from the publisher amazon is selling that book for 950 um it's a loss leader uh they're selling books at a loss to get people hooked into their data um they call it a flywheel uh to get them hooked into their systems in more profitable arms than retail um of course we can't do that um, i did a quick calculation once that like if we sold all of our books at 45 percent off it would be enough to keep us open for uh six days we'd have to turn our inventory every six days uh, and our inventory turns maybe two or three times a year. So that's just really unsustainable to sell books at those prices. And that's, they do that in every retail industry they enter. Um, their jobs are dangerous. Amazon loves to talk about how they pay $15 an hour and they have healthcare from day one, but their warehouse jobs are twice as dangerous as other warehouse jobs. A uh, person working in an Amazon warehouse is twice as likely to be injured at work as their industry peers. Um, they disrupt the supply chain. They do this largely by building their own unregulated shipping network. All those prime vans are part of a dangerous and unregulated um, ground up shipping network Amazon has built, which is messing with uh, people's expectations about shipping and the, the beloved uh, postal service and other, other things like UPS and FedEx. Um, there are lots of privacy and surveillance concerns um, from their Alexa devices and their ring doorbells, both of which are owned by Amazon. Um, the fact that they're trying to be the everything store uh, means you can get dangerous or counterfeit products. It's really hard to regulate what exactly is sold on Amazon. And they're very, um, if you're a third party seller on Amazon, they charge you exorbitant fees and they, they make your life difficult in many ways. And there, there are a lot of issues with the government. You hear frequently that Amazon and other large companies like it pay little to no uh, federal income tax. Um, and they're really good at extorting huge tax breaks out of local governments. Um, so that's a really quick rundown. Um, more on this later, but I just wanted to, to show that my issue with Amazon is bigger than books. Um, it's really even bigger than small businesses. We're talking about privacy in the government. Um, so these are really, really large problems. And like the quick answer to why you need to resist Amazon is it's a lot more than just cheap books. Um, so this... This kind of conversation, um, I learned a lot of this stuff from just talking to other booksellers as I entered the industry, which was interesting. Um, it was kind of uh, an introduction to these issues. The, the book industry is really good at having these discussions um, internally at conferences. Um, we, we love to complain about Amazon. We love to strategize about how to, um, how to deal with it, how to build a bookstore that can thrive. Uh, even in the face of all this. Um, but I was, I was noticing as I entered the book industry at the store owner level uh, that this conversation wasn't happening between me and my customers that much. It was happening between me and other booksellers, um, which was interesting to me. And it, it felt kind of stuck. That felt like a closed circle. Um, I felt like if we were going to really need to make any momentum on this, it needed to be a really big conversation. And people, you, people needed to talk about this across the board. Uh, and booksellers needed to figure out a way uh, to, to bring th these issues out of the bookseller conferences and directly to their communities. 
So one way we uh, decided to do that as the Raven was via social media. Um, and we had always kind of talked about uh, this stuff uh, on social media. It, was, it wasn't a focus, but it was definitely there. And we were also willing to have these conversations in store. Like we were ready to have the conversation of like, oh my gosh, this book is $26.95. I found it online for 15. You kind of need a quick answer for that. And, and all of the booksellers here have developed that. But then uh, in April, 2019, um, happy two year anniversary to all this, I guess. Uh, I just did a quick Twitter thread about that very discussion about a customer who decided not to buy a book from us. Um, and you see in the second tweet there, there's that bit of math um, about how long we'd last selling it at these prices. Um, and, and for whatever reason, this tweet thread took off. Um, and you can see the numbers. Uh, we've got 24,000 retweets and 50,000 likes on that first tweet. Um, this really sparked a discussion um, on, on Twitter and, and reached far more people than our um, anything we've ever done ever did it just exploded our audience exploded we got orders from across the country and all of a sudden we found ourselves kind of in the middle of this discussion uh mary smith who's a pulitzer prize winning columnist for the chicago tribune wrote a, a column about us um and, and about the tweet thread and about the issues in the thread um and it was this point i kind of realized i have an audience um i have people listening to me um i need to be careful to um take advantage of this, not for sales, but to get the message out. Uh, and, and if people are listening to me, I need to be responsible and do what I can to create positive change. Uh, so that motivated me um, to write a letter to Jeff, <laughs> um, to Jeff Bezos. This happened about six months later. Uh, more and more people were paying attention to what we were doing. Um, I think the Raven became one of the more vocal bookstores in the country about issues like this. And I decided I needed a manifesto or just a thesis statement. This is the former English teacher in me. Like, what's my argument? Um, what, am I, what am I fighting for and what do I wanna know? Uh, so I wrote this open letter to Jeff Bezos to, to serve that. I posted it on our social media. Um, it, it, was, it caused another big splash on social media, but basically it's a one page summary of my issues of what we've been talking about so far and what, um, what I'm looking for to happen. Um, and then this, this is the Cleveland connection number one. I posted this um, and then my friend Suzanne who runs Max Backs in Coventry, uh, which is a great bookstore, um, sent me a text and said, um, I would love to have this as a broadside or a zine uh, to hand out to my customers so I could sell this across the, the front counter. Um, and I love that idea. You, I was already concerned with the idea of bringing this to customers um, I had learned how to make zines in uh, grad school. I made poetry zines while I was at KU um, studying poetry. And so I really quickly just put together um, a, a little pamphlet called How to Resist Amazon and Why. It was 16 pages. It included the letter. It included a couple tweet threads, uh, some pictures, and a, a new essay or two. And this was the quick, this is a quick, cheap, and portable way to make that conversation happen across the, the front counter. Um, I expected to sell, uh, I don't know, like 50 of these at the Raven. And all of a sudden I got um, emails from bookstores all across the country looking to sell them um, around the world, in fact. And I, I became really overwhelmed uh, trying to keep up. I spent all my afternoons at Kinko's and all my nights um, with this fancy stapler putting together hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of zines. Um, so eventually at this point, um, the, a, a publishing company in Portland called Microcosm Press reached out to me, um, and, and they're super cool um, for a couple of reasons. Number one, their founder, Joe Beal, is from Cleveland, um, and they just opened their second warehouse in, in Cleveland on Miles Road. Um, so uh, I, I love that they were had a Cleveland connection. Um, they're also a, a great fit for this project uh, because they're one of few publishers. They might be the only publisher of their size in the United States that refuses to do business with Amazon. So they don't have an Amazon account. They don't send their books directly to Amazon. Um, you ask any other publisher, um, Amazon accounts for half of all book sales in the United States and 75% of online sales. And so at every publisher except Microcosm is like, we can't give up that many sales. Like we, we may dislike them, what they're doing to the book industry or what they stand for, but we, we literally can't do without half of our sales. Uh, but Microcosm um, 
in a spirit, in a kind of punk DIY spirit, said, what if, let's try it. Um, we're going to do our, we're going to build a warehouse. We're going to do our own distribution. We're going to try to make it without Amazon uh, and their sales have actually gone up and it's become a really vocal and central part of what they do um, in, in one part by publishing a version of my zine. Um, so they reached out and said, um, we'd love to help. We'd love to distribute this and make our own version of it. And I was like, oh my God, thank you. I need help. <laughs> I'm so tired of spending my nights stapling zines. So that came out in October, 2019. Um, and, and just was, um, you know, it, I'm, I'm still stunned at how much it's taken off. Um, Microcosm has sold 30,000 copies of their version of the zine um, all around the world. Um, I love seeing pictures like this on social media uh, from other bookstores and other customers. Um, it was really stunning how quickly it took off and, and how widespread it was. Uh, people really connected with this message. This is one of the things that give me hope. Uh, uh, you know, a self-published zine I put together in a couple hours that takes a really strongly anti-Amazon stance has sold 30,000 copies. I think that means that people are interested in this discussion. Um, so because it was selling so quick, let's see what's next. Okay, enter the pandemic. A little bit of this is about how um, the Raven has navigated the pandemic too, um, because it's been really tricky and I think it's related. Um, we uh, remain um, closed to browsing. Um, we haven't had customers in the store in more than a year. Um, so we, we, pivot, we were able to pivot really quick because of this online advocacy, this, this uh, having our voice online um, had us ready to go. Like part, the, the online experience was part of the Raven already. And so it was easy to, it wasn't easy, but we were ready to subtract the in-person um, element and still have some part of the Raven living online. Uh, so if you're on Twitter, you know, give us a follow. We'd love to connect. Um, but we um, we implemented free delivery really quickly. We closed browsing really quickly, um, and we were kind of ready to go with with online e-commerce. Um, and uh, we ended up in the New York Times talking about it. This we're going to operate like a pizza takeout place is a quote from me. Um, and we're, this was last March and we're still operating like that and probably will until our new location is ready. Um, but again, this finding our voice online kind of made this possible. Um, and, and the reaction has been great. Um, people have been really thankful. We've just made it a point to say we're trying to take care of our employees, keep our customers and our staff safe. Um, and, and the comments have been immensely supportive. Um, so uh, yeah, that's where we are right now. We, we just opened a walk-up window. So we've got, um, last week, we, we had a second door that hadn't been open in like 20 years, but we, convert, we had a locksmith come out and we converted it into kind of a walk-up window. So it would be a drive-through, but it's on a pedestrian street. So people can walk up and talk to a bookseller and place orders and get recommendations there. That's the kind of first reintroduction of in-person bookselling we've had uh, since March. Uh, but ultimately, in 2020, our sales were up 25%. Um, and, and that's, um, we're really lucky. We have a hugely supportive community. I'm a little stunned that that happened. Um, American Booksellers Association lost 75 bookstores last year. So more than one bookstore per week was closing during the pandemic. Bookstore sales overall were down, um, which is sobering in a couple ways. I, I don't love, the bookstores were actually entering a moment where they were doing fine. And we were, we were having a little bit of a renaissance of bookstores until the pandemic hit. Um, and I'm a little worried about what's going to happen because um, e even though bookstore sales were down, the, the book industry was up. Um, and so what does that tell you? That tells you that people are going to Amazon for books. Um, if bookstore sales are down and the, the overall print books are, are healthy, um, it means we're still losing customers uh, to Amazon. And, and the Raven is an outlier in this. Um, but I think more importantly, there is growing antitrust momentum in Congress. Um, it's a bipartisan issue. Neither the Republicans or the Democrats particularly love uh, how big big tech companies have gotten. Um, and I think the public discussion of, of the issues and problems surrounding Amazon is, is growing. Um, and I'm, I am hopeful. Uh, I was, you know, it's, I don't think the, um, I'm going to take a drink really quick. The um, warehouse workers in Bessemer, Alabama, last week turned down a union vote, um, which in some ways is a little bit of a setback, but I think the, the publicity surrounding that story um, 
was an important spotlight on, on labor rights. And, and we're still making progress on this discussion. Um, one way I'm taking part in that discussion is we have turned the book, the zine into a book called How to Resist Amazon and Why. This came out uh, last month. And just today, actually, the audiobook uh, version, which I read, uh, is, is available. Um, the, the folks at Libro FM have helped me with that. If you're not familiar with Libro FM, it, the website is Libro.fm. That is an indie bookstore friendly audiobook source um, to compete with Audible, which is, of course, owned by Amazon. Um, so uh, the, the book is an expanded version of what I talked about in the zine. I focus a lot more on government and those antitrust issues, which we can talk about in the Q&A if you'd like to. Um, but Microcosm Press published the book. The zine was uh, 16 pages. The book is 120. Um, so it's, it's expanded. It's researched. It has further reading suggestions in it. And I got to spend a year kind of really diving into this issue. Um, and I think it came out at the perfect time. I think people are really talking about this. And I think we're getting some momentum. And I think people are realizing the dangers of this company. Um, so yeah, I mean, like, as, as we mentioned, I was on Australian TV, uh, last week, this is from, it's a show called the drama on ABC, which is Australians, um, uh, public TV station. I was also in the New Yorker, the great writer, Casey Sepper, the profile of the store and our advocacy. Um, so again, um, not to toot my own horn. I just think that it's, um, people are paying attention and people are really interested. And th these are discussions we've had in the book industry for years. And, and I think the, the only innovation we've had is, is making sure our communities and our customers were involved in this conversation. Um, and there's overwhelming evidence that, that people are interested um, and, and aware and excited to do what they can uh, to, to curb the influence of this large and dangerous company and big tech monopolies in general. Um, I don't know how we're doing. I would love to um, talk. I would love to make this as interactive as I can. So that those are my slides. Um, I don't know if there are questions in the chat. Um, okay, I see Laura said, please repeat the competition of Audible. Um, that's Libro.fm. I typed it in the chat. Uh, it works the same way. Um, I think a, a subscription is $14.99 a month, but there are different plans. Um, but you have an app on your phone and you can just download your audiobooks. It works the same way. Uh, much of the same selection is on Libro and a portion of each sale goes to a bookstore. Um, you can also pick your affiliate bookstore on Libro FM. So I'm sure all the Cleveland bookstores have pages where you can make whatever percentage of that sale go to Max Bax or Logan Berry or the Learned Owl. Um, so yeah, Libro FM is great and they were instrumental in making the uh, How to Resist Amazon and Why audiobook happen. <sighs> a question from Judy. <laughs> Can you talk about book release dates? Yeah, this is good. <laughs> um, Cheer, cheerleader mom. <laughs> thanks. Uh, one, this is an, one of many, many ways that Amazon kind of wreaks havoc in the book industry. Um, so uh, a book comes with a publication date. The, Tuesday is new release day. There are lots of great new books that come out today and we're not allowed to sell, um, sell books. I'm actually gonna go grab a visual aid. Okay, here I am. I get the benefits of being at work while I do this. Uh, this book is um, Empire of Pain by Patrick Radden Keefe, the, Se the Secret History of the Sackler Dynasty. This is an amazing brand new book. Patrick Radden Keefe is a staff writer for The New Yorker. Um, that, the book is an inside history of the Sackler family who are the owners of Purdue Pharma and really the kind of people who caused the opioid crisis. Um, they're a hugely secretive family. Um, he did amazing work uh, getting to them without their co cooperation at all. Um, he's told the complete story of this family and their impact on the pharmaceutical industry and countless lives. The book is so sensational that it was embargoed, which means we got these books in the mail uh, from UPS last Friday. We literally had to keep them under lock and key until today. I wasn't allowed to talk about them. I wasn't allowed to show people I had them. They were, they, they, I had to sign a piece of paper that said, uh, in order to sell this book and get it on time, you have to keep it under lock and key until the release date on Tuesday. Um, I imagine there are lots of legal reasons in this case. Um, it's also to build excitement about the book um, and, and to make it have a big splashy, uh, if everything about the book comes out at once and he's on the Today Show and the New York Times runs a review, 
you want a lot of publicity in the first week. And so we need to keep it under wraps so nothing is spoiled. Um, and I'm like, sure, this book is going to be great. Uh, I signed the paper. I agreed. Um, I'm, I'm talking to you about it now. I couldn't have this conversation with you about it yesterday because I wasn't supposed to tell you. And this is really standard procedure, um, especially for really big titles. Um, and there have been a couple instances where Amazon has mailed out this kind of book early. Um, they did it with Margaret Atwood's latest book, um, which was the sequel to The Handmaid's Tale. Um, and, and people get it in the mail a week or 10 days before the publication date. And it's, I know Amazon had to sign the paper. Um, everybody has to sign the paper. The book is embargoed for everybody, not just independent bookstores. And, and Amazon can just say, oops, um, and, and not really face consequences. If I break that embargo, um, I lose, I could, I could owe the publisher money. I could lose my new release privileges and get late shipments on everything else. Um, it, it's, we get in big trouble and it's happened before. Um, so that's the, the issues here are, I think there are two issues. One from our standpoint, it makes it seem like we can't do, it makes it seem like Amazon can do something that we can't. It's like, well, why am I going to order from this bookstore? If not only is it going to be more expensive, Amazon's going to get it to me sooner. Um, and, and that's unfair competition. Um, in fact, it, it, it breaks, um, it definitely breaks publisher policy, um, you know, and like unfair predatory competitive uh, practices are, are illegal as well. Um, and then also like, the publishers are kind of scared to challenge Amazon on this because Amazon has been known to play re hardball really intensely with publishers once if they're in a dispute. And again, Amazon, Amazon has such a monopolizing share of the book market that the publishers are scared to do anything. Um, so they can really get away with it. Uh, in, I think it was in 2011, Amazon had a, a really big spat with uh, Hachette, which is one of the big five publishers about um, ebook pricing and the they canceled all Hachette pre-orders any book any Hachette book that was available for pre-order they took the buy button away and they bumped a lot of Hachette titles to the second page of search results and like once it's there that's no man's land uh, so um, out of fear that they would do that again these publishers aren't going to really push back on these publication date um, violations so it's just one more way that Amazon can get away with something that we can't. And like, we're trying to play by the rules. And we're, we're also a note on this pricing thing. Um, the perception that indie bookstores are selling books for more money, like we're, we're charging the actual price of the book. Um, the, the price is printed right here. Uh, this is a 3250 book. Um, it's printed right there on the lab, on the, the dust jacket. Um, so we're not the ones adjusting the price of books. Amazon is, they're adjusting them downward. And that's, that's causing kind of havoc. And in the book, in my book, I argue that that's devaluing the idea of the book in general to, to do that kind of large scale experiment and deflating prices that's gonna make books less valuable. Um, and I'm, I'm not arguing that only rich people should access books. I'm just arguing that the people that create and sell books should be fairly compensated for their work. Good question. Did Jeff Bezos respond to your letter? No, not yet, <laughs> still waiting. Uh, in, the, in, the, in the letter, I, I, I invite him to Lawrence, Kansas to show him around a, a, a town that's got a bunch of great small businesses at the heart of its community. And I mean that. Um, I would love to walk him around uh, and show him. Um, the, I invite him for a slice of pie at Lady Bird Diner, which I couldn't do today because Lady Bird Diner um, has for the last year shut down as a restaurant and acted as a food pantry, giving away 200 free lunches every day uh, to people in need in the community. <laughs> Uh, and that's just another great example of the way a small business can really uh, um, build and nurture its community. Um, okay, Francis in the chat. Another thing that concerns me with Amazon is book censorship. Can that be a problem with them or is it with the publishers? Yeah, I mean, this is, we talk about this a lot. Uh, this is, I, this falls under the everything store problem. And Amazon was founded as something their guiding principle at the beginning was the everything store. Like we'll sell everything. We'll be the source for everything. And they're, they're realizing that that's a, a kind of a fraught position to take these days. And they're, um, they've eliminated Nazi material. They've eliminated um, anti-vax, uh, you know, kind of pseudoscience about the pandemic. Um, and that's a tricky thing for them. 
in my bookstore, I, I carry about 13,000 titles, um, which sounds like a lot, but it's not. There are millions and millions of books in print. So I make a thousand decisions every day about what to carry and what not to carry. And that's a normal part of book selling is, is curating. That's part of what we do is we, we build a collection of books that we think is of interest and value to our community. But when you promise to be an everything store and when you have a monopolizing share of the book market, when you decide not to sell something, I think you are kind of approaching something like censorship. Um, and, and the idea of a book getting canceled is, uh, is in some ways a misnomer, except in Amazon's case, because when a company has 75% of book sales and half of all book sales in general, um, you really are limiting access to that book if you decide not to sell it. So I think there is a danger of a company being too big having free speech implications. Um, and I, I think that's a great point, Francis. And I think it is a concern. Um, so uh, yeah, it's just a matter of Amazon being too big. And like, if a small bookstore decides not to carry a book, there's always somewhere else to get it. Um, but it, it gets tricky when you have a monopoly on book sales. I wonder if writers and authors would band together regarding this issue. That is, I mean, it comes down to that monopolizing share. This is why monopolies are so dangerous. Like it's, I think some authors, not me by any means, but some authors might be worried about tanking their sales if they, if they tell people not to buy them on Amazon. Um, and it's just another piece of evidence that their share of the market is too big. Um, there are, I mean, there are authors who are great about it. Um, there are authors who are very good friends of independent bookstores. I think every bookstore kind of has a roster of, of authors who are on their team, frequently local. Um, and, and we really value them. Um, one way we partner with authors is do, to do signed pre-order campaigns. Um, so if an author who's friends with us or is local has a new book coming out, we'll sell signed copies and pre-order. And that's a great way to support that bookstore and that author. Um, and, to get, and to get a little perk, to get a signed first edition too. Um, so that's one great way to support author, not only independent bookstores, but authors who are on the same team as independent bookstores is to, if you see a signed pre-order for a book, um, you know, go for it. Uh, one way this, this happens a lot, I think, is with links um, and, and talking about authors and where they, they link their books. Um, I know, for example, um, Glennon Doyle, who wrote Untamed, um, is a really big champion of indie bookstores. Um, so she's offered exclusive signed copies to indie bookstores for the past year or so. I mean, they come with this really pretty kind of cheetah print with her signature. Um, and she's always talking, she's to the point where she's this year's Independent Bookstore Day ambassador and she's doing a special event um, later this month. Independent Bookstore Day is April 24th. Um, so there are a lot of authors like that who who are who are um, big champions for indie bookstores but you know then again I think there is some pressure from publishers uh, to not ignore that segment just because it's so big oh Dan Rather right yeah um, Dan Rather is a huge advocate for independent bookstores um, as well he retweeted our New Yorker article which is kind of a thrill not a sentence I ever thought I would <laughs> utter is that Dan Rather retweeted us one of my booksellers is laughing in the background um, any questions? Any other questions or thoughts? So talk about um, one of my pet peeves and that is, so we have cities who fall over themselves mm -hmm. Amazon build, you know, a distribution center where they pay no taxes, they contribute nothing to the local community, and we still see this happening time and time again. I mean, I think that's one of the, the big problems with the whole infrastructure of how Amazon operates. Yeah, well, I mean, when... Um... It just for me, like my one of my guiding principles with running a small business is how can I contribute to my community? I think paying taxes is one of those ways. Like the, the checks I write for taxes are going to pay for roads and, and everything else. And the guiding principle for Amazon is how much can I extract from this community? Like how long will they promise me I don't have to pay taxes? And this is from the, the most profitable country, the most profitable company in the world and the world's richest man. Um, 
and the um, they they really there's a huge pipeline of tax benefits and tax breaks that are used to to lure big companies, and and Amazon is one of the champions of that sport. Um, and every time you see a press release celebrating a, a new Amazon fulfillment center opening and bringing a thousand jobs, it's like, well, uh, you know there's going to be very little tax revenue from that warehouse for a long time because they were probably promised a giant tax break for 20 years. And those jobs are, are dangerous um, and grueling and, and lead to quick burnout and have very high turnover and little opportunity for advancement. Amazon really loves to talk about how much they pay their employees, but there's still a huge percent, you know, a huge percentage of Amazon workers are on, are, are on SNAP benefits. So like, how much are you really paying your workers if they still have to, um, they still need federal assistance to eat? Um, so it's, you just take it with a grain of salt whenever you see that celebration. And I, I'm firmly opposed to this kind of corporate welfare, especially for a company as profitable as, as Amazon. Um, I think one, there are a couple um, kind of large scale examples of resisting Amazon um, that I talk about in the book. I think one of them is the Headquarter 2 search, where Amazon launched this, this giant contest, like what city is going to host our next headquarters? And they had cities uh, present massive troves of data to Amazon to kind of compete to, to host these headquarters. And of course, data to Amazon is the most valuable thing. And now they have all this information about how how municipalities work and the tax breaks they're offering to willing to offer large um, corporations. And then they picked New York City and Washington, D.C., which were kind of a foregone conclusion all along. Um, and, and Washington, D.C., or Arlington in specific, has welcomed Amazon um, with open arms. And New York City pretty successfully fought them off. Uh, and th there was large scale protest from the city government, from, from people and from federal legislators like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez um, that raised enough of a stink that Amazon withdrew their plans uh, to, to build this headquarters. And then a couple months later, they leased office space like a regular company um, at regular rates uh, and regular taxes. So um, they still had a presence in New York City, but they went about it like a regular company without huge government handouts. Uh, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's a dangerous thing. And it's, I don't think it's the way to make communities prosper um, is to deflate the, the revenue base like that. Um, I understand creating a business friendly environment, um, but uh, I, I don't think that's the way to do it. I think that's very well spoken, Danny, with the corporate, um handouts like that and i think it's shameful that bezos does that when he's billions of dollars and then these towns get nothing i'm yeah. all for, i'm all for business too but not not in that way right well and meanwhile the, the companies that don't have huge profits or are trying to make it or trying to start out have to pay normal taxes and you know um yeah thank you for saying that um, I see in the chat, Barbara says, as a book lover, I really enjoyed your presentation. We have small bookstores where I live in Lakewood. I used to live in Lakewood before I moved to Lawrence. I love Lakewood. Um, I will provide your information to them. Thank you. That's great. Um, cool. Other questions or thoughts? So how can we help you get the word out? What are things that we can do to, because uh, when women, our community, we're all about action, honey. <laughs> okay, good. I what love that. Um, I, you know, it's um, in many ways, this is a government problem with a government solution. Um, I think the question of Amazon size is really why has Amazon been allowed to get this big and out of control? And that's because that's, that's a question of government and how they interpret antitrust laws. Um, so I think it's important to put pressure on your legislators. When we offered uh, uh, the, the signed pre-order for this book from The Raven, it came with a pin, which Yolanda is wearing. Um, thank you. And it came with the pre-order goodie was a postcard, a pre-stamp postcard uh, with a message to your legislator. And like, I think that's one of the most important things you can do is keep up pressure on, um, on the people making policy uh, about how you feel about Amazon and what you view as their dangers. And there is bipartisan consensus. Um, we were talking about canceling books. It was in kind of a funny twist of fate. Um, the, the Josh Hawley book that, that was withdrawn uh, after that whole thing was a book criticizing big tech monopolies. And so like, this is something that Bernie Sanders 
and Josh Hawley are kind of on the same page on, which that, that alone gives me massive hope. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, um, you know, keep up there. There's really good stuff in the works. I think there are a couple of really hopeful appointees that, that Biden has sent down. I think we might get somewhere with the government. So it's important to let the people who represent you know. And again, even on the city level, um, because it might come down to something like government contracts, like where the government buys office supplies or, or what kind of businesses they're trying to lure to your community. Um, to make sure that the government is aware of how you feel about this um, is important. And then another way that we've found really resonates with our customers is not telling people not to shop on Amazon, but instead, trying to encourage them to shop at local businesses. Because uh, like one customer canceling their Prime account um, and, and stopping their Amazon habit isn't gonna make that much of a difference to Amazon because they're so big. I'm not sure Amazon would technically feel it, but the small business that gets that business instead definitely will feel it. Um, and if you buy one book a month on Amazon and stop, Amazon's not going to feel it, but we'll the Raven will definitely notice that new customer who's regularly supporting us or, um, or people who are buying wine from Yolanda instead of from Costco or Trader Joe's. Um, those, it makes people feel a lot better. Um, and it, it gives people a lot more efficacy um, to feel like they're supporting the small businesses in their community. Um, and so I think that positive spin, I really try not to shame people for shopping on Amazon. And I, I try not to make it seem like this whole thing is about individual consumer choice. Um, it's kind of how people uh, have, have tried to pin the whole climate crisis on individual consumer. Like if you buy the fancy light bulbs, you might solve global warming. I think that's a total red herring too. But it's the same thing. We shouldn't pin these massive corporate and government problems onto the individual consumer because it makes people feel helpless. Um, but instead, um, we're really kind of strongly positive pro small business um, in, in what we argue. And I think that argument really resonates. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. And, and we are a community of, of small business women owners. And so we, we understand how that, how that works. But I, I was reading um, a book. Uh, John Maxwell's new book, and there's a, the story of the starfish, right? The little boy throwing the starfish back into the water, and there's thousands of them on the beach, and somebody walks by and is like, what are you doing? It's not making a difference. And he picks up a starfish, and it's like, to this starfish, it makes a difference. So to that small business owner, to that bookstore, to that independent wine shop, it does make a difference, that one little switch of buying a book a month from them rather than Amazon. It does make a difference, absolutely. Yeah. Right, and then once we build up the network of, of small businesses and, and make sure they're there spreading the word and making a positive difference in their community, uh, I, I think that's good progress uh, towards sustaining and nurturing our communities. This has been great, thank you so much. This uh, gives us action. Things cool. that yeah. I, I love that and um, definitely going to, uh, I'll send you an email. I'd love to have you on my podcast, cool. talk about this a little bit more, any, any way that we can help get the word out. I, I cool. love it. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. It was a lot of fun. Anything else? I'm going to stop the recording. <laughs>